My experiences with the Yeti started when I was eight years old. I will explain why I call them Yetis later in the story. I live in southern Colorado and have never lived anywhere else. My story is one that is unique because I never allowed these creatures to scare me off my family's homestead. Most folks would have sold out long ago. My parents never believed me about what I had seen or what would torment me when I would do chores in the early morning hours. Chores were always started at 4 a.m. every morning. We operated a small ranch with cattle, pigs, horses, and sheep. It was a lot of work, but it was one that I enjoyed doing. My first encounter was in June of 1969. School had just let out for the summer, and I loved going outside at night to play. It was so hot during the day, and we never had any air conditioning to speak of until I was older. I was sitting outside by our back door with my two dogs. One dog was an Aussie, and the other was a Queensland Blue Heeler. They defended our livestock and us with their lives. The healer began to growl, and I stood up to try to see through the darkness at what had him so upset. Each one of the dogs placed themselves on either side of me. I began to walk towards my dad's tractor, which was about 15 yards from the back door. We had three big cottonwood trees that were 20 feet from where I was sitting. As I approached the cottonwood tree, the dogs became aggressive. They were both growling in threatening tones and were still on either side of me. I stood peering into the darkness and my eyes adjusted, and a creature stood up above my dad's Alice Charmer's tractor. The creature's shoulders were wider than the bucket on the tractor's front end, and its upper body was more than three feet taller than the tractor itself. It had a huge head with no neck. My dogs by this time were going nuts, but they never left my side. The creature roared at the dogs, a horrible roar that vibrated through my body. So loud was the roar that it was painful to endure, and I was sure this was the end for me. The dogs ran, and so did I. Crashing through the back door, I fell flat on my face, screaming, and my leg was caught in the screen door. I couldn't get my leg out and I thought the monster had a hold of me and would jerk me back outside. My mother ran into the kitchen. She opened the screen door to free my leg, but she couldn't calm me, so she slapped my face. That brought me out of my hysterics, but when I told my folks what I saw, they told me that I was imagining things. That was the start of many strange and unusual oddities that plague me to this day. When I was eight years old, I thought a monster had settled on my river. I didn't know what I saw or what it could be. I didn't grow up with computers like kids have today, and there was never any time to go to the library to research what this thing was. Every morning when I went to do chores, the dogs were always with me, but they were always on high alert. As young kids, we were taught to pay attention to the livestock and our dogs, They would let us know of impending danger. In the mornings when I would do my chores, I would hear brush being smashed down and heavy walking approaching the back of the barn. The dogs would growl as a warning to me and to the creature that was approaching. My barns and corrals sit right next to the river bottom, and my back pasture borders the river as well. The river bottom is thick with tamarisk trees, cottonwood trees, and many other types of trees and thick brush. We had our place fenced so that livestock would not get out so we could contain them for the most part from reaching the river bottom and escaping. 
On several occasions, one or more of these creatures would hit the back of our wooden barns with a stick or a rock or something while I was feeding the livestock. It would echo through the bottoms like a jet breaking the sound barrier. We were raised to never run from anything wild, and believe me, it took everything I had not to run. I continued my feeding of the livestock, and I would head back to the house trying not to show any fear. These things would push over trees just to get my attention. I spent most of my young years scared to death of these creatures. I'm the youngest of three siblings. My sister is the oldest and 10 years older than me. The high school kids would throw their graduation parties under our bridge and put their beer in the river to keep it cold. They would have a bonfire, roast hot dogs, and drink beer. Back then, you could drink at the age of 18. They would laugh and carry on as kids do, paying no attention to their surroundings. In 1972, on a beautiful spring evening, a group of high school kids were partying under the bridge to celebrate graduation. I could see the bonfire lighting up the circles under the bridge. One of the guys went to get some beer from the river. Something snatched him off the trail and he was thrown to the top of the circles of the bridge, which are 25 to 30 feet high. The young man was screaming and he hit the ground and the rest of the kids came running. He was scared to death. The impact broke his arm. He told the rest of the kids what had happened, but he had not seen what grabbed him and threw him. They extinguished their fire, helped the kid to a car and took him to the hospital. The sheriff was called, and he came rolling in the next morning to check things out. They wrote it off as a bear attack. A bear can't pick up a human and throw him that high. What nonsense. I knew what had happened, and I knew what had thrown him, but I never said a word. That was the last of the parties under the bridge. My father was a World War II vet, and he was a no-nonsense man. His word was law, and if he told you to do something, you did it without question. I tried to convince my folks of what was going on, but they didn't believe me. We lived in a two-story old house, which was built in the early 1800s. There was no foundation, only large wood piers driven into the ground. My bedroom was on the ground floor, and the creatures would come to my bedroom window and tap on it. I was so scared and I would tell my mother about it, but she would say that it was just the trumpet vines that grew outside the kitchen window. I went outside to see if the vines could reach the top. They didn't reach my window at all. I tried pulling on the vines to see how far they would stretch, but they wouldn't reach my window. I would get into trouble for pushing my parents into believing me, and at some point I just gave up. I decided to start taking a 22 rifle with me. We were taught how to shoot when we were small kids. Dad wouldn't let me take the shotgun because he was afraid that I couldn't handle it. It only took a day with the rifle to understand that taking a rifle doesn't help when you're forced to set it down in order to pick up hay or grain and then walk away from the rifle to feed the animals. Something inside me always warned me not to shoot at them, though, and to this day, I have never taken a shot at one of these animals. A few years passed, and I noticed that the creatures were not around my area at times. When the river became dead quiet, I knew that they were back, though. They had stopped making themselves known to me because I tried never to show a reaction to their threatening behavior. The creatures pushed me, pushed me hard enough that I wanted to cut loose on them with the rifle, but I never took a shot. I believe they felt I was not a threat to them after all. I'm assuming all this, but for the most part, they never attempted to harm me. We had a grain bin inside one of the sheep barns. My dad would grind his own grain to give the sheep. The bin was made of concrete and there was only one way in and one way out. I would never go into that grain bin to feed the sheep in the early morning hours because I knew I would be trapped with no way out. My instincts told me not to go in there, and I didn't. 
We had a lot of livestock, and my parents had a 4-H club. My siblings and I showed animals all over our county. I was a paid horse trainer by the age of 13, and I would take on problem horses, horses that would kill a person due to the owner's errors. I was familiar with all the folks in the local and state livestock community. During my time showing livestock at the county, state, and national level, I had the opportunity to talk to the native people who had booths and displays at the various county and state fairs. Everything you know from TV and the internet about these creatures called Bigfoot, I already knew years ago thanks to the knowledge of the First Nations people shared with me at the state and county fairs. According to them, they had many names for these beings. I told them that my creature had three toes. A yeti has three toes, they said. They warned me to always beware of my surroundings and to never let my guard down. I learned so much from these special people that I would forever be grateful for all the knowledge they gave me and their support. I was breaking a young Appaloosa gelding that had a hard time crossing water. My training routine for these horses was to walk them down to the river through the brush and let them get accustomed to the water. Time and patience is what it takes with horses. It took a good 30 minutes to get him across the water, and we rode for a mile or so upriver. On my way back, I noticed that the river had become deathly quiet, so quiet that I could hear my own heart beat. I started the horse off into a trot because I knew a Yeti was close by. I could sense something was near, but I couldn't see it. As I quickened the horse's pace, I heard the brush 30 yards off to my right begin crushing under something heavy paralleling me. I kicked the horse into a gallop and then a dead run, and whatever was in the brush was running and keeping up. The noise it was making was unreal. We got to the water and the horse was spooked and was refusing to cross the river. My heart was pounding and I could hear the creature approaching. I never looked back to see how close the animal got to me because I was afraid and I kept urging the horse to cross the water. Finally, he took the plunge and we made it to the other side, making a mad dash to the mouth of the river that led back to my pasture. It took a long time for me to go back to the river after that episode. I never expected to have that close of an encounter, and I thought it was going to be my last. No one would have ever found me for sure. It was unnerving. I was determined that these creatures were not going to keep me from my own land that I loved so much, but it was a few months before I gathered the courage to go back. But I did. After my encounter in the river on horseback and a few months later during the Colorado State Fair, again I talked to the native Indians that were there at the fair. I told them what had happened to me. They replied that the Yeti, Bigfoot, and others are and always will be the watchers of the forests, the rivers, and most wilderness areas. They stated that they respected these creatures and would not push their luck at all with them. I was advised to leave any area that I suspected or had a sense the creatures were near. Their ancestors warred with these animals. Eventually, a natural line was drawn between them and none of their kind would cross that barrier. I left thinking, well, hell, what am I going to do now? I can't just surrender my land to these things. I decided that I would continue to do what I had always done, and I would figure things out as I went along. By this time, I had been around the Yeti for years, and I could sense when they were in the area. I didn't tell anyone about my encounters until I was married and had children of my own. It may seem that these encounters were everyday occurrences, but that was not the case. Nonetheless, it was common that I heard them breaking brush in the river in the early morning hours or late in the evening, and other small things that someone who was not looking for signs would ever notice. It is my experience that showing fear empowers these creatures even more, and it seemed for a while that these things were going to work out. 
One thing they always did, though, was let me know when they were in my vicinity. When I was 14 years old, I was babysitting my nephew, who was four years old at the time. He wanted to go and throw rocks in the river. So I took him for a while, and everything was going great. It was the middle of July, and the day was growing hot. Pretty soon, I noticed that the area had grown quiet, and I knew that it was time to go. There was a loud crack in the thicket across the river. I grabbed up my nephew and ran all the way home. My brother and I got the binoculars out and got close enough to the river to see what was torn up. The creature had ripped a six-inch green cottonwood branch out of a cottonwood tree. These creatures always let me know when they're near, and that was too close for comfort. They didn't try and attack me or charge me, but they sure scared the hell out of me. Life went on, and soon I was married. Everyone in the area that I knew had grown up and moved away. The incidents on the river had stopped for a while, and everything was quiet on our place. My father was dying and asked me to move back to take care of my mother after he passed away. My husband and I put a 14 by 70 mobile home on the place. I had two small boys when we moved back, and I wondered if the creatures were still in the bottoms. I would go out in the evenings and early mornings to see if I could hear them, and all was well on our land. Everything was peaceful, and I could finally enjoy being there. When my oldest son was 14 years old, the Yetis made their appearance once again. This boy would have his first encounter with these beasts, and it was a violent one. I told my boys of my encounters on the river with the Yeti as a warning to them to beware of their surroundings. After leaving home and going to college, I researched these creatures through Indian folklore. I learned a lot. They liked kids and could care less for adults. They seem to be attracted to kids for some odd reason, maybe because they have trouble raising their own to maturity. My oldest boy had a friend stay over with him, and they went to the river to mess around. My oldest had a dirt bike, so the boys left on it to go explore. They went just east of the bridge, which is not my place, but they wanted to cross the river to explore the other side. It had been a wet spring, and the river was running pretty high, so they parked the bike and were going to cross the river on foot. My oldest happened to look across the river and up the embankment and saw a yeti standing there watching them. This creature was a sentinel. He was standing guard as the other creatures rested. My son tried to divert his friend's attention so he would not see the creature, but his friend did see it and he went into hysterics. He was screaming and pointing and then his friend took off running. My son ran to his bike as quick as he could and kicked started it and looked back and the creature was standing right behind him. My oldest took off after his friend, grabbed him and got him on the bike. The Yeti took off running through the tamarisks trying to cut their escape route off, but my oldest spun the bike around and was able to get away. The two boys burst through my front door. My son's friend was hyperventilating and he was going into shock. My oldest explained quickly what had happened. I told my oldest to call his mother and to get the boy some water and a wet washcloth, and I headed to the river with a rifle. I had never had them attack me, and if these creatures were that aggressive, then there was going to be one short in their clan. When I got to the area where the attack took place, I couldn't believe my eyes. In front of me was a horizontal tunnel through the tamarisks. Tamarisks grow in these river bottoms. Cutting a hole through them to make a tunnel-like shape would be very difficult. But there it was in front of me. I didn't know what to make of it. It was as if a horizontal whirlwind or vortex had shot through the trees and carved out a perfect tunnel. I looked down and I saw fresh scat from an animal that I couldn't identify. A bit further, I saw a set of tracks. I had never found tracks, and I had looked for them relentlessly. If these animals were living on our property, they had to leave tracks. I came from a hunting family, and we all know how to track an animal, and we know exactly what species we are tracking. 
This was my mindset for years, but I never found a single impression that was not an animal I was familiar with. And out of nowhere, here were two well-defined tracks from a creature that has no identity in the books. When I got to the second track, the trail ended. It was as if the creature had vanished. I was stunned and I couldn't find any more. I scanned the area knowing that I would see one of these things, but nothing was there. I was angry and upset at the near tragedy and that I could not teach these beasts a lesson. I went to where the boys first saw the creature. The embankment, looking up it, was 15 feet tall. The river was running high and fast, and I saw no tracks running in either directions, but I was sure that the beast had gone back across the river. And I didn't have time to track the creature. I needed to get back to the boys and be there when my son's friend's mother arrived. Upon returning to the house, I found the boy's mother picking up her son. I tried to explain to her what had happened, and she called me crazy and sped away. I turned my attention to my oldest son to make sure he was okay. He told me that the creature was over seven feet tall, it had wide shoulders, and was really aggressive. I called my mother, and we went back to the area. This time, I brought a Ziploc bag to gather the scat I had almost stepped in. Finally, I had proof of the creatures that plagued me as a child, and I showed my mother. When we returned from the river, my mom called a good friend of hers that worked at the newspaper who was a photographer. He came down and took pictures of the footprints for me, and he chewed my mother out for not documenting my stories. Mom told him that he could not print the story because she did not want the creatures hunted nor did she want to deal with a bunch of people running all over her property, and he agreed. I turned my attention to picking up the scat I had spotted earlier, and to my surprise, the steaming pile was gone. If you think these creatures are not intelligent, you would be wrong. There was no trace of that evidence anywhere. When an animal gets upset, and then calms down, they excrete their bowels. It's just what animals do, and the Yeti is no different. This incident did not deter my boys from going to the river bottom, though, and I was relieved about that. Years later, I learned from my youngest son that the boy who had experienced the attack that day with my oldest required extensive psychiatric help. I felt awful about that, and because of that experience, their friendship ended. I was told that the boy never goes to a river of any kind, and he has a hard time hunting as well. I was sorry for what this kid had been through, and I do not let anyone into the river bottom at all now on my property. There are neighborhood kids who knew the stories of this incident. They were raised on the river bottom, and this creature didn't scare them that bad. My boys soon came to realize that when the bottom gets quiet and no animals can be seen or birds stop chirping, that the creatures are there. I finally summarized there must have been a leader change in the Yeti clan. This would explain the aggressiveness they had shown towards my oldest son and his friend. My youngest son, God rest his soul, was in the river bottom east of the bridge sitting on a neighbor's tractor-trailer flatbed. Our neighbors kept some equipment down there. He was 12 at the time, and while sitting on the trailer looking off into the bottoms, he witnessed a huge black hairy creature running through the tamarisks with ease. He told me that he could not understand how this creature could go through those trees without making any noise. I had no answer for him. That fall, after my youngest son's sighting, my husband's brother wanted my youngest to travel east down through the river to meet up with him to hunt white-tailed deer. It was a thick, foggy morning, and I tried to convince my boy to just stay home. It was the start of bow season, and he would not hear of missing out on a chance to get a white-tail. They left at 5 a.m., and I told him to listen and pay attention to his surroundings on the river. The fog was thick that day, and visibility would be low. Thirty minutes later, the front door flew open, and in walked my youngest son. 
He was upset, and I asked him what had happened. He told me that as he was walking through the fog, something was trailing him or paralleling him as he was moving through the river bottom. He decided to turn around and come back home. He didn't know what it was, but it was big, and he could hear the footfall through the leaves and brush was heavy. That boy had no fear of anything. I mean anything. He would always say, if it bleeds, it can be killed. If he had other encounters when he was young, he never told me about it. When he was 20, he had an encounter that was face-to-face. My mom had signed the homestead over to me. I was the only one that cared about the place. We tore down the old two-story house and put a modular home in. As construction started on the place and ground was being broken, we would see these huge footprints that had walked all around the area. We started this project in November and there was snow on the ground which made the tracks easy to see. I told my husband, who had never had an encounter, that this was proof that these creatures existed. After we moved in, everything was all right until the weather turned warmer. It was the summer of 2001 when my son had a face-to-face greeting with the Yeti. My youngest would always get up at 2.30 a.m. to relieve himself. Then he would go into the spare bedroom where I kept the blinds open and look down at the barns where the animals were kept, making sure that everything was okay. This was a habit with just about everyone in our family. As he approached the window, he could see a shadowy shape standing upright and flat against the outside wall of the barn. As he walked closer to the window, he became alarmed at what he was seeing. The creature turned and faced him through the window, and for several seconds, they just stared at each other. My son slowly backed up, ran to his room for his rifle. He was going to kill it, but when he returned, he had second thoughts. He wasn't sure of the target and elected to hold his fire. He later went back to bed, and he slept with his rifle. Three hours later, at 5.30 a.m. the next day, my son left for work. I got up a few minutes after he left, and at daybreak, I started my chores after my husband left for work. I got down to the hay barn, and there was blood all over the hay, all over the ground, and the 10 cubic foot wheelbarrow I cleaned pens out with was full of blood. You could see where some animal had laid in the front of the wheelbarrow and bled into it. On the inside of my barn were deep gouges in the wood. They are still there today. I was astonished at what I was seeing. It was a bloodbath like someone had been murdered in there. I checked my livestock and they were okay. My neighbor was outside and I knew he would have heard something because he always keeps his bedroom window open at night. I walked across the road to explain what had happened and ask him if he had heard anything. He said he heard two shots that night, one on the bridge and one further up the road, and it happened at 2.55 a.m. When my son got home, he began telling me the story of what happened earlier that morning at the spare bedroom window. All that had happened at 2.35 a.m., Again, my neighbor heard the shots at 2.55 a.m. I then proceeded to tell my son what had happened at the hay barn and took him down to see the carnage. I believe one of these yetis were seen on the bridge and someone running the roads that night, probably a local rancher checking his animals, took a couple of shots at it and obviously hit it. The beast had made its way to our barn, gone inside, and bled all over everything, and then left, or died and was taken away by others. We spent a long time that evening looking for tracks around the barn, but we couldn't find anything. The only evidence we had was my son's sighting and the blood all over the interior of the barn. And then, for a while, everything quieted down on the place. These events were not isolated encounters with just my family. There were five boys that lived on our road who ran around with my boys. All the kids spent a great deal of time in the river bottom. I began getting phone calls from their parents wanting to know about a huge hairy animal walking on two legs. 
I was hesitant to tell them about what I knew because I believed they would think that I was crazy. I've lived there all my life. My neighbors had not, and this is why they looked to me for information. I avoided the topic, but later felt as if I needed to inform them. I felt like their safety was more important than what they thought of me, so I suggested that they instruct their kids to exit the river whenever they heard anything strange or if the river bottom became very quiet. These creatures had scared the neighborhood boys, and I did my best to calm their fears. I did tell the boys of my experiences with these creatures, and I cautioned them to remember that these creatures are a living, breathing, unpredictable wild animal. I knew that a few of the boys had been in the woods and had been charged by a yeti. Those boys stayed out of the area for a while. My boys never quit running the river bottom, and I never stopped them either. They were hunters, and they knew if the river bottom got silent that a huge predator was close, and they never went in there without a rifle. We all knew when the river becomes deathly quiet, and I mean so silent that you can hear a pin drop, you better believe these creatures are there, and you better get out. My oldest son got married. He had two boys of his own and eventually moved to Montana. My youngest son married and moved a mobile home on the place down by the pig barn, which was close to the edge of the river bottom. The creatures were not happy about that at all. There was something about that old pig barn. We never kept pigs there. That was something my father handled, and there had not been pigs on our property for a long time. But the ground where the pigs were kept was special to the creatures. While doing regular work in the ground, we found antique bottles and coins from a century or longer ago. Old Indian artifacts were uncovered there as well pieces of old pottery, and other items. I believe something is buried there, and the Yeti hold it as sacred. It is the only explanation that makes any sense to me for them to be so protective over that small area of our land. What is buried there? I wouldn't know unless we tore the structure down and started excavating. I have even wondered if there is a First Nations people burial site deep in the ground. We may never know the significance of it. My son and his new wife didn't live in their new home long before strange things started happening. My youngest was a machinist and he worked nights. His wife was pregnant and worked during the day and got home when it was dark. She would come home and eventually be calling me and telling me something was rubbing on the side of the house. I would walk down with my 357 and my flashlight, but I never found anything. My son had told her about his experience, and she knew about the beasts. I found it unusual that she was raised on the same river where we lived, but she was not familiar with the wildlife that lived in the area. Her parents forbid her and her siblings to play in the river bottoms at all, period. Her dad was raised on that river as well and was living on his family's homestead. I think he knows more than he will ever admit. Late one evening, my son heard human-like screams coming from the river. He went outside to look around. Walking the pasture road with his forty-five, he heard the screams begin to get closer. Whatever this was, it was moving towards him and at a good pace. He turned and put several rounds into the river bottom, and that silenced the creatures. Later that week, they moved from their trailer to a vacant rental trailer we had on the property. They soon after sold their trailer and stayed in the rental further away from the river. She was pregnant, and he didn't want her dealing with these things in the woods. After the move, the creatures stopped harassing the young couple. But it would not be long, though, before they started in on me again. One evening while my husband was at work, I was up late watching TV waiting on him to get home. I was sitting on the couch and it was 11 p.m. and I heard a clawing noise at my dining room window. It sounded like something was trying to get inside. I flew up out of that couch, called my son, got my 357 and my floodlight and headed outside to see what in the world was trying to come in my window. 
To my surprise, my son was already there outside heading to the west side of the house. We both looked around and we found nothing. At that time, I had a Queensland Blue Healer and an Irish Wolfhound mix, and they were nowhere to be found. I went back in the house, and my son went back home, and 15 minutes later, I heard Semi, the healer, softly growling outside. The dogs had come home. I thought, oh my gosh, what now? And I picked up the pistol again and eased out the door, and there was my son leaning against a tree watching the area. A gentle breeze blew across my face as I walked down to talk to my son. Mom, these things are back, he said. Listen, you can hear it breaking brush and tearing up trees in the river bottom. He was right. You could hear it moving through the river woods, and it was not trying to be stealthy. We stayed out there for 30 minutes listening, and apparently whatever had been close to the house had moved on. We both went back to our houses, and the rest of the night was quiet. I miss my son. He was a modern-day mountain man. I have never seen anyone with the unusual physical strength this young man had. I had never known any man who had natural ability with a bow, a rifle, or a handgun. He was an exceptional tracker as well, and he never once crippled an animal while hunting. If he took a shot, the animal never suffered. He eventually opened his own gun shop. The business grew quickly, and it became popular within a year of opening. He did well with his business and with no formal education at all, but his passion was firearms, and he poured himself into the business. He and his wife had two children, a boy and a girl. As they grew, my son would take them to the river to romp around. Those grandkids spent a lot of time with us. At the end of June in 2011, the grandkids and I were standing on the porch of my house when we started hearing some strange gibberish coming from the river bottom. My son and his wife were in their backyard working. I caught their attention and motioned with my hands. Do you hear that? They nodded yes. My grandkids and I walked down to their house and my son went inside to get a predator call. He walked to the pasture and started playing an animal in distress call. We stood there patiently watching the tree line 200 yards away at the back of the field. His wife asked why he hadn't brought his rifle and his reply was that nothing was going to show up in the middle of the day but he was wrong. Something showed up all right. A huge gray figure appeared, and it began to levitate five feet off the ground. It remained hovering for a minute, and then it quickly spun away from us and darted back into the trees towards the river. I laughed at my son when he yelled out, oh shit, and then sprinted to his house to get his rifle. We all waited for it to reappear, but it never did, leaving us standing in the field quite perplexed. The next week, my grandson went with me down to collect trail cameras. His parents were at the gun shop, and he was staying with me. We headed down to the mouth of the river and made it a short distance. When off to my left through the tamarisk, I heard a loud rustling in the brush. I looked, and my grandson looked, and we saw this gray thing running through the trees. I was spooked a bit, but we continued to collect the trail cams. We brought them in, took a look at the pictures, and found nothing of interest, and we headed back to the river to put them back up when we heard a deep growl. My grandson said, Nona, did you hear that? I said, yes, partner, I did, but ignore it. It's the Yeti telling us that we are too close to them. I told him that we would do our business and ignore them. When we came up out of the river, we headed for the house. He wanted to play outside down by the horse stalls, and I needed to do some yard work. A few minutes later, I heard him screaming, and I ran around the house. Nona, Nona, it came for me. The gray one came for me. When I got to him, he was describing what this creature looked like. It was big, Nona. It was gray, and it came up out of the river by the trees. I got him back to the house and left him there while I ran back to the barn with my pistol, a camera, and a measuring tape. There had to be tracks left by this one. 
I found a foot track in some loose dirt, and further up the hill there was a clean handprint where the creature had hoisted itself over the top of a knoll. The foot impression was 15 inches long and 8 inches wide. With all of this activity happening with my family, my grandchildren were at ease with all of this. They were like me. They didn't worry too much about it. They lived regular lives as kids usually do. Their father, on the other hand, had no patience with these things. He wanted to kill every one of them. Sometimes I think that I should have let him. In 2011, I sent a summary of the events to several investigators who I thought could help us. A team of two researchers responded and soon came to take a look around. We spent the day walking my property and talking about all the events since I was a child. I was surprised that they didn't want to stay the night and experience some of the activity we had talked about that day, but they seemed to be in a hurry to get out of there before the sun went down. Brave investigators, huh? However, they left two trail cameras with me and showed me how to set them up. They recommended good spots to place the cameras, and they even showed me what to look for in the photos. And then the brave researchers left well before sundown. Through the years, I bought more trail cams, and I've captured remarkable photos of all sorts of things. Yetis are not the only cryptids that live in these woods. These creatures can communicate with us. I discovered this in the summer of 2018. I drove down to the river on my four-wheeler to cast a track that I had found that morning. My healer was with me. She was getting old and she moved slow that summer. I finished the cast and my dog and I were about to head back when I noticed the woods around me got quiet again. No noise at all other than a gentle breeze blowing the leaves. Every hair on my body stood on end. I knew what this meant. I started the ATV and I began to pull away. I was urging my dog to speed it up a bit when in my mind I was told to leave the area now. They were telling me that they were coming. Oh, this flew all over me, and I stated in a clear voice so they could hear me that I would leave when I was damn good and ready, and that is exactly what I did. My dog and I took our own sweet time heading back to the house. That was the only time I had anything like that happen to me, and I know it sounds crazy, but I am not crazy. It happened, and I will never forget it. I know when they're around, and there's no need to relay it to me telepathically. These things annoy me often. They will knock on my door at night or scratch on the windows to try to get me outside. I ignore them so long as they don't try and get in the house. If that ever happens, chaos will ensue for sure, and guns will be blazing. In August of 2018, I saw something that shook me to my soul. My husband had just left for work, and I decided to go outside to enjoy the beautiful morning. I stood on our porch, soaking up the cool morning with my dogs at my side. It had been a hot summer, and this day was no different. I glanced down by the mouth of the river, and I saw a dog man standing in the middle of four large elmwood trees grouped together. There was an opening between the trees, and this thing was just standing there. Razor, my youngest dog, picked up the creature's scent and started growling, but she stayed with me. I stood there staring at it, thinking that it must be the way the sun was creating a shadow. This had to be an illusion. It never moved. I checked the time on my watch, and it was 6.30 a.m. I decided I would come out the next morning at the same time to see if it was indeed an illusion due to the sun's position. That afternoon, I went down to do chores, and I took a tape measure so I could measure how tall this creature was. If there was actually a creature there at all, this thing would have stood nine feet tall, and the width was four and a half feet wide. I knew that dogmen existed. The stories of this creature had been around since I was a kid, and there had been reports, but it had always been on a back road on the other side of the river. 
I got up early the next morning and waited for 6.30 a.m. to roll around, and then I stepped outside. It was another beautiful morning, just like the day before. To my surprise and horror, the opening between the trees was clear. I stood there staring into those trees, thinking the creature might reappear. Thankfully, it did not. Its head was shaped like a Doberman. It was tall, wide, and thick. The beast I saw was a well-proportioned, muscular creature. Its head was rounded between its pointed ears, its arms were long, and it was slender through the waist, but not too much like others have described. I couldn't see its eyes or its mouth. It was a hundred yards away, and my vision has deteriorated with age. Still today, I can't believe a dogman made itself known in broad daylight. I hope it stays away for sure. I know how hard it is to kill these creatures. I've seen their muscle mass now and their sheer strength. There's no way a human can run from them and get away. I will digress for a moment to share some information that I have gained from these experiences. Over 50 years of experiences while living with these creatures. If you have been charged or chased by any of these beings and believe that you got away without a severe incident taking place, like losing your life, I want you to rethink it. You got away because they let you go. If you do not have a strong faith in the Lord, consider yourself lucky you are still alive. I have lived with these things for a long time, and it is the Lord that has kept me and my family safe. Don't go hunting for these things. You're only borrowing trouble. I don't have to hunt them. I know them. I understand their ways and how they react to me and my family. I know what they can do to other animals and how they hunt. I've lost a few dogs in my time and wondered where those dogs went, but it became obvious what had happened to those dogs. Nothing comes from seeking these creatures out. Nothing. Being human makes us curious, and being curious can get you killed. Common sense must come into play when dealing with these anomalies. If what I read and listen to for the most part is truthful, then these creatures are having a hard time living with humans, and that only means there will be more confrontations, and that means someone or something is going to get maimed or killed. You can have all the heavy armor you want when you go looking for these things, but if you don't understand what you're up against, a big rifle or pistol is not going to do you any good. God be with all of those who look for these creatures. Enough of my preaching and on with more encounters. My first Irish wolfhound was a special animal. His name was Jake, and we had him for 15 years. He was a big dog. I am five foot three, and Jake came up to my hip. He was highly intelligent, and he loved humans, and boy, could he fight. He was extra protective of my family and my livestock, and he never cowered from a fight with the creatures that harassed our place. We also had a Queensland blue healer whose name was Semi. In May of 2012, I came home from work to find both of these dogs with horrible lacerations over just one of their eyes. I brought them in the house and doctored their wounds and checked their bodies for other wounds. Semi, the female, had swelling on the side of her head and my guess is that her skull was fractured. I sat with them pondering on what had hurt them so badly. I believe they took after one of the creatures in the river bottom. Something had to have hit them with such force to fracture Semi's skull and split them open like that. The wounds were on the opposite eyes for each dog, leading me to believe they had attacked the creature from both sides at the same time. I also surmised that whatever hit them knocked them down and threw them into the raging water to drown them. They were soaking wet when I found them. It had been raining in the higher elevations and the river was raging. I don't know how those dogs got out of that raging water without drowning. Jake healed more quickly than Semi did, even though he was older. They stuck around the house, never venturing towards the bottoms for a while. 
that convinced me that they had run in with one of these many creatures that lurk on my place. Semi took three months to heal, and she had no mental problems that we ever noticed. All my dogs that I've had since an adult never showed any fear of these creatures except my first two. They do not cower down. They become overly aggressive. I lost my dog Jake to cancer. It happened shortly after I lost my youngest son. When it rains, it pours. 2014 was a hard year for my family. My son passed away in October. We lost a little chihuahua in November, and Jake died in December. I was looking for another Irish wolfhound mix, and I found Razor, who is now five years old. He's pretty special and has taken on these same critters, nearly getting himself killed. He has the same courage Jake had, and he's not as big or as tall, but he has a courageous heart. In June of 2016, I went down to do chores. Again, it was 4 a.m., and I was headed down to feed the mare. I finished up and headed back to the barn to get feed for the dogs. The dog food is kept in a drum just inside the barn door. As I was scooping up the dog food, I heard a deep, low growl right inside the doorway. I was instantly afraid. I knew what that growl meant. I spun around ready to take on whatever it was, and I noticed Razor patrolling the area. He had instantly come to my defense. I shined my light all over the place trying to get a fix on whatever was trying to have me for breakfast. I supposed the creature slipped away quickly and there was no further incident, but I was relieved to see Razor looking frantically to find the source of the growl. The whole thing scared me really bad, and now the dogs are fed in the daylight when I get home from work in the afternoon. Razor and I had been through several encounters together. Again, it was early and I was headed to the barn to feed the mare. Razor took off towards the pasture to do his morning business, and I was taking the hay around the barn to pitch it over the fence into the mare's manger. I heard Razor come unglued on the other side of the barn, snarling and growling like I've never heard him before. I instantly ran around the corner with my pitchfork in hand. Razor was standing on his back legs straight up with his nose in the air trying to catch a scent. He was frantic and angry and ready for a fight. I walked to his side and he began to calm a bit. I paid attention to the air, too, with my nose, hoping to catch a scent. I never picked up anything, but Razor knew what was out there. I know what was out there, too, and I wasn't going to stay down there any longer. It took me a long time to calm my jitters once in the house. I told my husband what had happened, and he told me to start packing again when I do my chores. But the next morning, my husband took up my morning chores for me. He didn't want me getting hurt in the dark out there feeding the animals. My husband is a good man, but he's not much for talking unless he's pissed at me, and then he has a whole lot to say. (laughs) Keep this story in your thoughts. It will become important later. A few years ago, my husband and I were headed into town to get some lunch. We left our driveway and were crossing the single lane bridge when I just happened to look east of the bridge into the river. In broad daylight, standing in front of the trunk of a giant elm tree was a man-like beast standing upright on two legs. Its body was covered with hair, but I could see its tan-colored skin beneath. The nose and the lower jaw protruded in an unnatural and abnormal position. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. As we drove across the bridge, I watched it stand there with its mouth hanging open and its arms outstretched. Its hands were big and I could see hair hanging past its fingertips. It was built like a freight train. It was a massive creature. We made it to the end of the bridge, but not before I noted a mark on the trunk of that elm level with its head. Later that day, I went down to measure its height against the elm trunk, and my tape measure read eight feet. I don't know what this thing was. It didn't look like a Sasquatch or a dogman. 
The image of this thing was disturbing because of the sparse hair and its unnatural face. This sighting haunts me. There was something evil about that thing, and I don't want to run into him in the woods. A few paragraphs back, I told you about the creature growling at my feet while I was in the big barn getting dog food. Two of my show horses were attacked in the pasture next to the road that runs past our place. I went down to feed the animals and clean out the pens, but my horses were all over me. They wouldn't leave me alone. Believe me, this is strange behavior. Their stomachs always come first. I started examining them, and my mare had rake marks on either side of her hips and a huge rip on the front of her left shoulder. My gelding had been raked, clawed from under his chest along its belly all the way back to his privates. These two horses were 18 months old. They stood over 16 hands tall and each weighed 1,200 pounds. The marks on the mare were from being pulled down across a T-post. The gelding appeared to have reared up to strike whatever was attacking them to defend himself and the mare and was raked by claws on his chest and belly. I took them to the vet and the mare needed stitches and I needed to see what I could do to help the gelding with his wounds. The vet told me the gelding was lucky that his guts weren't spilled. The rake marks were deep and there was nothing the vet could do for the gelding except to tell me that time would heal the wounds. He gave me an antibiotic spray to apply to the gelding's wounds and sent me on my way. I was in a rage over what had happened to my horses. I thought at first that it could have been a mountain lion, but I quickly dismissed this because there isn't a mountain lion big enough to pull a 1,200-pound horse down on a T-post. Even the vet said he didn't think it was a mountain lion. A big cat would jump on their backs or lunge for their throat or hind legs to latch on to, but to physically grab them around the top of the hind quarters at that height of the horse would be impossible. Mountain lions are strong and are apex predators. Even on other continents, big cats have to have their hind legs on the ground to pull down their prey. After the incident, we moved the horses to the big pasture behind my house to allow them more room to get away in case of another attack. The gelding changed after that. If you walked across the pasture at dusk or at night, you would hear my gelding thundering across the field to take you out. He meant business and would forever be preemptive when dealing with a predator. Kids would come out of the river bottom in the pasture at night after a day of playing in there, and they were quickly run out by my gelding. By 2018, my mare and gelding were gone. They were fantastic horses, and I missed them. I still have a little red dun mare, which is over 15 hands tall, and she weighs about 1,200 pounds. She is the only show horse, cutting horse, I have left. She's 21 years old now and has gone through quite a bit since she's been by herself. In August of 2018, I went to do chores around 2.30 in the afternoon with Razor and Semi at my side. I pitched the mare some hay, took the wheelbarrow and bug spray and headed into her pen. Before cleaning the pen, I began to spray the mare down with the bug spray. The mare spun around quickly and she surprised me. I saw a huge, muscled cat-type creature running on the pasture fence line closest to the river. This monster cat was 14 to 15 feet long. Its tail had to be 8 feet long. It all happened so quick that it seems like a blur to me. However, I noticed that the color of this cat was wrong. It was a light fawn color on its sides fading to solid black down its back and tail. It was wide across its shoulders and through the back area. Its face was like a cat, but it was much bigger. Its head looked like the fur was clumped up all over its head, like you were looking at clumps of hair, but all over its face. I could not determine exactly what its face looked like, but this animal was enormous. It was gone as quickly as it had come. The dogs looked at me as if to say, what in the hell was that? The mare turned back around and began eating again. I stood there trying to wrap my mind around what I had just seen. 
I don't like big cats. Mountain lions will tear you up, not to mention they will eat you. They are wicked predators, and this cat thing was nothing short of mind-blowing. I stood there for over five minutes staring into the river bottom with a fear I had not had since I was an eight-year-old little girl. Big cats are nothing to fool with, and this one was beyond big. For days, I played over and over in my mind what I had seen that day. I believe that was the creature that growled at me when I was in the big barn getting food that night. A regular mountain lion does not like dogs, period, and tries to avoid them. This is one creature I would kill in a heartbeat because I know that it would try to kill me first. I don't need a big cat on my place of that size. A cat that big means it eats big, and I don't want to be on the menu. Why it let me see it is a mystery to me. Maybe to let me know that it had claimed my area as its hunting ground. I really don't know. I've read and heard testimonies of these huge cats being in the southern part of the country, but not once did I expect to see one on my place. Of all the creatures I've seen or captured on video, this one gives me worry. If you cannot hear it coming, which I didn't, and even if you have a gun, I still think you would become its next meal because cats are so cunning and stealthy. You would have to have seen this animal to understand why I feel this way. Do I believe this is the creature that attacked my mare and gelding? You bet I do. It had the weight, the length, and size to pull my mare down on a T-post. I'm grateful that my mare and gelding did not become this animal's next meal. Maybe it was looking to attack my red dun mare that day, but the dogs and I were there to prevent that. I've not seen this creature since, and I hope it has moved on. These days, I am being watched. When I work on the ranch, the birds are singing and the river is alive with nature, but as soon as I throw the hay to the mare, everything starts to get quiet. Some of the birds in the river are squawking and throwing a fit because there's a predator around which stirs up my dogs. The neighbors across the river's dogs are raising hell, and then there is dead silence. Razor has his nose in the air sniffing, and Semi is on the edge and alert. Every day this goes on. Even so, I grab the wheelbarrow and clean the pens. It's when I have to go behind the mare's barn and dump the manure that all my senses are on high alert. Everything is so quiet, but I go about my business. My dogs never leave me, and once I'm done dumping the waste, they leave the area with me. I know if these creatures wanted to kill me, they would have done it a long time ago. My point is, how can I have so many different species of cryptids on my place? Sometimes I regret putting out trail cameras because now I can't do without them. Knowing what I know now, there's no way that I'm going to take them down. I guess I've come to grips with the fact that I have strange animals running up and down the river because no one has any answers for me. I've seen so much, been through so much with these things that my own grandson said, Nona, how boring would your life be without these creatures? My only answer to that is, boring would be nice. I love nature and all it entails, but these are creatures that should not exist. It throws the balance off of nature, in my opinion. On December the 27th, 2018, my husband told me that I was missing a hen. He had looked in all the usual places for her, but had not seen her anywhere. It was 6 p.m. and almost dark. With my spotlight, I started for the mouth of the river with Razor and Semi. The sun was long set in the west, and I was standing at the mouth of the river trying to shine my light into the tamarisks, looking for my hen. She is always the last one out of the river bottoms, and I thought just maybe she was hunkering down for the night in the brush. I shined the light to my left, and there was Razor pacing back and forth on the edge of the water with his nose in the air. Then I got nervous. It's a long way back to the house if something came barreling towards me. On top of that, I had just had knee surgery, and I couldn't run very well. 
I calm myself and I shine my light to the left, and at 60 yards or so, I saw a round ball of dark matter behind a young cottonwood tree. The tree was two foot around, and this dark matter stuck out two feet wider on both sides of the tree. I caught blue eye shine coming from the dark matter. The thing kept staring at me, and then it would duck its head and then look at me again. Finally, it dawned on me that I was looking at a baby Sasquatch. My blood ran cold because I knew its parents had to be close. Razor was still trying to get the scent of this thing as I spoke softly and told him to come on. We headed back to the house in a brisk walk. I put the dogs in and I told my husband what had happened. He thought that that was probably what got my chicken. I was none too pleased to hear that. The following Saturday, I had my youngest grandson over. He's 11 years old. This young man is exactly like his father. He is already a good marksman, and he can track animals. It was a cold, windy, and cloudy day. I needed to collect my trail cams and put them back out. I was setting out number four of five cameras that I use and adjusting the angle of the shutter. I looked down the trail and I could see Razor acting strange, head raised, sniffing the air. Instantly, he lowered himself to the ground to make himself smaller. He looked over at me a few yards away and then looked back at whatever had him spooked. Slowly, Razor began to back up. This dog never backs away from anything. He had plenty of room to turn around and come to me, but he didn't. I went ahead and finished with that trail camera, and Razor finally ran over to me. The cold wind blew through those trees, and snow started falling in sheets. Something was way off. I could feel it. I yelled to my grandson to get out of there. He got the message, and he gunned his four-wheeler up the bank to the pasture. With the engine noise of his ATV fading, I sat there quietly, and I watched. I could hear something coming down the trail. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. My ATV roared to life, and I was about to ascend the bank, and I looked back down the trail. On both sides of the trails, trees were bending erratically side to side. It was a windy day, but the wind we had that day did not make those trees do that. Something was bending them physically. For a moment, we saw something black blow past inside the trees. Those trees are 18 to 20 foot tall, and whatever this thing was reached almost three quarters of the height of those trees. It was there and then gone in a split second. We both thought the thing was going to pop out into the pasture at a different angle in another spot, but it never did. Everything about that day was weird. The weather, the dogs, the feeling we both had while we were down there by the water, nothing seemed right. Earlier in my story, I wrote that there was something much larger than a Bigfoot in those woods. They are something altogether different than Bigfoot or Dogman, and these things can cloak and blend in with their environment. While cloaked, they move through the trees making all sorts of noises, big logs breaking, brush being crushed down, and even trees snapping off or shaking like we saw on this day, and you would never see them do it. I have heard the Yeti walk through the river bottom. Yes, they are big and have a heavy footfall, but nothing, and I mean nothing, compares to whatever these things are. Once the Yeti tried to step over a hot wire fence in the pasture and got zapped in his private parts. The scream that came out of the creature made your heart skip a few beats. I've heard the Yeti step into the river and I could hear the water rushing around its feet and then step out of the river, and then everything was quiet. This anomaly worries me. It worries me a lot. I can't see it, but I know that it's there. I believe the fallen angel creatures are to blame for all of this nonsense. I believe they might be the Nephilim, and that makes them dangerous. It would make sense that they back off when you call upon the Lord. That means they absolutely know who God is and the power of his word. It also means they are far more intelligent than people give them credit for. In recent months, black unmarked helicopters have been flying all over my property. 
I don't know what they want or what they're doing. However, I have a suspicion they are in the military and they're doing livestock mutilations. Maybe it is a new weapon they are testing and they are content to let the blame go to a UFO theory. But there's no way to know this for sure. Hovering over the grazing fields scares my horses and it infuriates me and my husband. Apparently, they saw me coming through the field with a rifle in my hands once. My husband also charged the helicopter at one point. They left quickly on both days. I think they were going to do something terrible to my horses. A lady in Black Forest, Colorado, caught a Black Hawk hovering over her cattle. She actually took shots at the chopper. Arrests were made, but I don't know what her case looked like after the arrest. She was smart because she called the sheriff in the newspaper. Smart lady. I'm sure they were threatening her as they have many others. It was great that she busted them. She wasn't upset. She flat out said what they were doing. And in my opinion, if you shoot one of these creatures or were attacked by one, call the sheriff's department and the local newspaper. I would call the local newspaper first. I have a lot of respect for the lady in Black Forest. Most people will discredit all that I have stated here, and that is their right. I don't really care if you believe me or not, but I have the evidence of most of what I have written here. It's taken me years to write all this down or even think about sending it off for someone to read. Call me crazy, but you would only have to spend a week on our place and your mind would be changed. How do you explain my researchers not staying out overnight? For me... I don't want anyone getting hurt, nor do I want to be responsible for someone getting hurt, killed, or disappearing. Do I think these things are part of Satan? I sure do. I've read the blogs about folks making statements about Bigfoot and how everyone should not harm them or shoot them because it's their territory. I own my place. I have to put up with these things on my place. They've killed my dogs, attacked my horses, and have tried to take my grandson. Don't be such a bleeding heart. These creatures would do you in if given half the chance. Those who have never had an encounter and make comments like that really don't know what they're talking about, nor do they have much knowledge of wildlife in general. If you have ever hunted big game, then you know what I'm talking about. I've seen what normal wildlife can do to a human. What do you think these things would do to you if they got a hold of you? I know they bluff charge. I know they growl and scream to get you out of their area. I also know they are having a hard time with humans in general. Thus, the missing 411 cases. The Lord put man to be ruler over all living creatures, not the other way around. I'm not saying go shoot one. I'm saying you better know how to handle a gun out in the woods if all hell breaks loose, because going hand to hand with these creatures would be your demise. Headshots, my friend. Take headshots. If you can calm yourself down to even get a good shot off. All what I write here is true, and I will continue to add to these pages as my encounters will continue. This place will be passed on to my youngest grandson because he loves this place as much as we do. My father's spirit lives on here, and he wants to be close to him. The place has to stay within the family because I believe if it were anyone else living here, they would be run off real quick. Good friends that know of my encounters and have seen the proof for themselves, they believe me now. They won't venture out here after dark, and if they're here in the daytime, they leave way before nightfall. I laugh at them because they do get dramatic. Take the good Lord with you while in these woods, for you are always watched. I call them the watchers of the woods. Take care and God bless.